First of all, hello and welcome. Um, it's my privilege to welcome you this afternoon to France and the Black Atlantic, Geographies of Slavery and Memory. My name is Neil Safir, and I'm the, uh, a professor in the history department here at Brown, and I'm also currently serving as the director uh, for the center of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Tonight's event is convened under the auspices of the Center of French Excellent, currently directed by uh, Louis Seifert of the, of the French and Francophone Studies Department, as well as the Office of the Dean of Faculty, with supportive co-sponsorship from the Department of History and the Ruth J. Simmons Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. For those of you who don't know, the Center of French Excellent Excellence is supported by the French Embassy in Washington and receives uh, recurring financial support and yearly project-based support to fund a wide variety of activities and research, both here at Brown but also at other universities uh, around the country. As I was looking at programs uh, in, uh, of the Center of Excellence last year in anticipation of submitting an application, I noticed what I thought was somewhat of an absence in the kinds of projects that had previously been supported, excellent projects, I should add. Um, and that also reflected something of a lacuna here in activities at Brown more generally. And that was France's relationship with African and Afro-French cultures, geographies, and histories. Despite France's long and now increasingly acknowledged role as a colonizing nation, its role as a perpetrator of violence and repression alongside other European nations in the horrific commerce in enslaved peoples in the Americas and elsewhere, and despite Brown's exceptional centers of excellence, that regularly convene workshops on the histories and legacy of slavery, and I would include here, of course, the Simmons Center, uh, the Department of Africana Studies, and the Department of History. Despite all of those things, France still felt to me relatively absent or at least underplayed uh, with decidedly less volume than the histories that we normally associate with the British, Portuguese, and Spanish worlds. So I thought it would make sense to convene an interdisciplinary group of scholars to consider these questions here at Brown. And the members of the French Center of Excellence graciously approved this proposal, as did the dean of the faculty. And I'd like to thank them for doing so. The idea behind this two-day workshop, most of which will take place tomorrow, um, and that we just inaugurated with Anne-Sophie Nanki's powerful Ici s'achève le monde nouveau, uh, um, was to engage with the burgeoning scholarship of French and Francophone ideas and ideologies about race, blackness, and the cultural and economic foundations of the transatlantic slave trade, and especially in the context of inter-imperial rivalries and colonization schemes from Africa to the Americas. At the root of these reflections is the insight offered by CLR James more than uh, 60 years ago that the enslaved who labored to produce the Atlantic world were also thinkers and political actors, as Laurent Dubois and Julius Scott reflected over a decade ago in Origins of the Black Atlantic. More recently, I had been struck by the proliferation in France of books such as Race et Histoire dans les Sociétés Occidentales by Jean-Frédéric Chaube and Sylvia Sebastiani, Les Mondes, les Mondes de l'Esclavage, uh, Pauline Ismar and others, uh, L'Art de la Race uh, by Anne Lafont, and many, many others as well, adding to the long list of texts on colonialism in the French Atlantic that included the pioneering works of Aimé Césaire, Louis Salamolin, um, CLR James, and, and many others. Museums in cities along the French littoral, especially Bordeaux, Nantes, and La Rochelle, have been especially active in recent years, recounting the grim narratives of slavery and servitude, largely because of their own historic ties to the slave trade. Parisian libraries such as the Bibliothèque Mazarine have vaunted their own burgeoning manuscript collections related to the French Antilles, but still the dynamics of the enslaved in the broader French world and their underrepresented presence in the historical archives remain, I believe, largely under-examined. And this is particularly true here at Brown 
with notable exceptions, including a lot of uh, work by Haitian scholars and uh, artists and initiatives at the CSSJ, as well as, of course, ongoing activity at the John Carter Brown Library. Since receiving funding last year, this workshop has very much grown organically through a variety of serendipitous encounters. Uh, one include with uh, historian Paul Cohen, just right outside the, um, on the street here uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, with my former Brown colleague, Hokinaldo Ferreira in Philadelphia, who spoke to me about Anna's recent, recent uh, book, which I had not at the time read. Uh, with Kayama Glover, who will be here tomorrow, who happened to be invited to Brown two weeks ago, um, but whom we've invited back uh, to offer some concluding marks uh, to the, uh, on our program. And of course, with Sabine Lamour, uh, a visiting scholar here from Haiti, who is one of our current scholars at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, as well as a participant tomorrow. Everyone here embraced the idea of an open forum to discuss and debate without the glaring eyes of a virtual public. Um, our apologies to those who had hoped for a live stream of the proceedings, uh, but we decided that we would learn and discuss best by leaving things largely informal and unrecorded. The pre uh, presentations tomorrow are being preceded by two events this evening. One was the film screening that I just uh, evoked, and uh, the other is a keynote lecture by Ana Lucia Araujo, which you are about to hear. I agree wholeheartedly with my colleague, uh, Joquinaldo Ferreira, that Ana Lucia Araujo is the ideal person to kick off this event on France and the Black Atlantic. Professor Araujo is a historian and a professor at the historically black Howard University. She has authored or edited a staggering 15 books on the history of the Atlantic slave trade and slavery. And her work has been funded by the American Council of Learned Societies, the Getty Research Institute, the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton, and the American Philosophical Society. Her most recent book, about which we'll be hearing this evening, um, which I should have up here with me uh, to, to brandish, I promise I'll do that later, is a stunning reconstruction of the itinerary and, uh, and, uh, and dynamics of a single object of prestige in the larger Atlantic world. It was published by Cambridge University Press in 2023. And in case you have already read all of the other books she has written on re re reparations, on museums and memory, on Atlantic slavery and museums, never fear, because yet another book is going to be coming out in October 2024, Humans and Shackles, An Atlantic History of Slavery, will be published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, uh, and her uh, uh, productivity continues to astound and humble those of us in this profession. To cite uh, Ana Lucia's achievements like lines on an academic CV only reveals one part of the story, however. Um, uh, Ana Lucia is and always has been a community builder. She is a fierce champion of other scholarly works on the history of slavery and the Atlantic slave trade, and she has created forum after forum to showcase the work of colleagues online and off, including especially during the pandemic. She's a tireless advocate for works by black scholars about the history of black culture and history, and likewise indefatigable in her support for female scholars in a host of fields. Uh, her work is inspiring, exacting, and exhaustive, and I can genuinely say there's no more productive scholar in the area of slavery, museums, and the early sources of modernity than her. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ana Lucia back to Brown, um, and as well as to thank the sponsors of this evening's keynote address once again, as well as Maria Sokolova, who is responsible for the French Center of Excellence, the staff of the Cogit Institute, Maria Isabel Marin of the Center for uh, Caribbean and Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Um, and uh, also to underline that after uh, Ana Lucia's talk on the second floor, there will be a reception where you can interact with the members and participants of the conference tomorrow. So with that, I turn the po podium and microphone over to Ana Lucia Araujo, who will speak on the gift of French Atlantic history of slavery and memory. Ana.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Neil Safir, for uh, inviting me and for this very generous uh, introduction. It's, uh, I am really uh, happy to be here, uh, to be part uh, of this uh, conference with several scholars who uh, I greatly admire. So, in 2015, uh, the Rossin Auction House in Paris put on sale to the highest bidder a large and unusual 18th century silver sword manufactured in France. Still today, this sword stands as an impression item bearing and engraving the dedication uh, written in French that reads, André Macaillé Mafouc, Le Juste de Cabinde. Then this dedication allows us to identify the sword as a gift to our writers, just dignitary based in Cabinda, a West Central African port in the era of the Atlantic slave trade. At first sight, uh, the object could be seen as any other 18th century silver luxury artifact produced in Europe to be given as a gift to a prominent person. But accompanying the ceremonial sword was an ivory plaque stating uh, 1892, Souvenir de la Campagne du Dahomey, then 1892, Souvenir uh, from the Dahomey Campaign. Then the engraved inscription suggests the sword was offered to an African dignitary, though the plaque indicates that the object was brought to France by the officers who fought during the wars that led to the conquest and colonization of the West African Kingdom of Dahomey. And this uh, sword at, at, at the time when it was auctioned, then it was the Musée du Nouveau Monde uh, from, uh, of La Rochelle in France that made the highest bid and purchased the object. So the question we could ask, and this is the, the question that I asked myself when I started this project, is how an 18th century object like this, given as a gift to a West Central African agent uh, in the kingdom of Ngoyo, uh, was looted from Abome, the Dahomey's capital, which was far away from Cabinda at the end of the 19th century. Then this book, uh, The Gift, How Objects of Prestige Shaped the Atlantic Slave Trade and Colonialism, seeks then to answer this question. I use this gift uh, carried then to different places by various peoples several times to tell the history of how the French slave trade operated on the Luangu coast in West Central Africa and in the kingdom of Dahomey in the Bight of Benin. And I look at how these societies were impacted by a trade in which people were considered as commodities, which in the words of anthropologist Arjun Apadurai are defined as, and I quote, objects of economic, uh, economic value and social potation, potential, unquote. So European agents acquired enslaved Africans in exchange for a variety of goods, such as European and Asian textiles, iron bars, rifles, and cowrie shells, and these items served as currencies. Gifts also have been described as an institution by scholars in classic studies, um, and it started, for example, in antiquity, the term gift uh, could be associated, for example, with taxes, dowries, and offering to the gods. Surely gift exchanges among rulers and visitors from distant lands have also been documented since antiquity, including, for example, in Homer's uh, poem, Odyssey, written then in the 8th century uh, BCE. And in these ancient accounts, hosts provided gifts to their guests upon their departure. Then the gift was then a memento of sorts, a keepsake that visitors from far away would carry back home. 
Menelaus, for example, the king of Sparta, welcomed Telemachus, Odysseus' son, son, and in his palace, he also offered offer him uh, gifts, and I quote, he would say, come now, stay with me here in my palace until 11 days or 12 have passed. Then I will send you off with precious gifts, unquote. As Telemachus just wanted a treasure as a present, Menelaus enumerated the valued items he would give to his guest, and I quote, I will give it different gifts, just as you ask. I will give you the finest piece of treasure of all the hoard I have piled at home, a finely crafted ball of purest silver with gold around him, unquote. So I see Alcinous, the king of Phaeacians, he pleased, uh, was pleased by Odysseus' wisdom and offered uh, him gifts as well, uh, because for him, hosts should do guests, uh, then should become, create friendships uh, with uh, their guests. So gifts, in many ways, sealed agreements and relationships. And in Homer's Odyssey, gift givers were the hosts and gift receivers were guests. Then in his essay, his, uh, then his classic work, uh, Essai sur les dons, translated as The Gift, uh, French sociologist Marcel Mauss reproduces also a verse of Avamal that is a 13th century Scandinavian poem that meditates about the problem of gift exchanging. And I quote, he says, with what the, the poem says, with weapon and clothes, friends must give pleasure to one another. Everyone that the, knows that for himself. Those who exchange presents with one another remain friends the longest. If, if things turn out successfully, unquote. So the poem emphasizes that presence at least indicated the intention of maintaining long-lasting friendships. Yet the poem also cautions about the risk that there could be obstacles along the path. Then in this context, exchanging gifts is a form of contract. Gift exchanges were also part of diplomatic exchanges in later periods during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in Europe and Africa, as well as in the Mediterranean world and more broadly and even in Asia. So, in the context of the Atlantic slave trade, and I am doing this long introduction also to say that talking about gift exchanges is not something that emerges with the Atlantic slave trade. There is a long history in scholars doing this kind of research all over the world in periods that they date back then to, to the antiquity. But in the context of the Atlantic slave trade, a variety of goods, such as European and Asian textiles, uh, also uh, some kinds of alcohol provided to African middlemen were labeled in the records as gifts. Yet, the nature of this presence remains complex uh, because to both European and African agents, these articles were conceived as a form of tribute or tax that European and American merchants paid to each African agent uh, at specific stages of the trade in enslaved Africans. However, there were also other kinds of gifts, such as finery and luxurious objects made of precious metals. Some of these gifts were also especially created for their recipients and embodied then symbolic elements that were meaningful for, uh, to the, the local agents. And uh, this is the case, as you see here, a crown commissioned by English traders after the St. Edward's crown to be given as a gift to the king of Alada or Ardra in the Bight of Benin in the 17th century. The story of this gift uh, is the, the, the topic for another, for another lecture, but in any case, 
here, in my case, I use then uh, the French silver sword as a framework uh, to understand uh, and to argue, indeed, that objects of prestige embodied the new power acquired by West Central African agents derived from the great intensification of the Atlantic slave trade in the 18th century. Then the silver sword also offers an opportunity to better understand how material culture shaped the Atlantic slave trade and colonialism, and how material culture was also modeled by the trade in enslaved peoples and the rise of European colonial rule in Africa. But before I continue, I would like to contextualize the region uh, or the regions we are looking at and why it matters then for uh, the French Atlantic slave trade history and memory. Now, the two major slave trading ports in West Central Africa were Luanda and Benguela. Uh, these were ports south of the Congo River. Uh, were controlled by the Portuguese, and uh, Luanda uh, exported nearly 2,826,000 enslaved people to the Americas, and Benguela, also south of the Congo River, 764,000 enslaved Africans. Meanwhile, approximately, and you are going to move here, approximately, approximately, 1,843,000 enslaved Africans were boarded on slave ships that left not from the south of the Congo River, but from the Luangu coast, from the ports uh, of uh, Luangu, Malen uh, Malembu, and Cabinda. Then these three ports that are north of the, the Congo River were controlled not by Europeans, not by the Portuguese, but by the only states that they were uh, the ports. So most of the slave ships that were purchasing enslaved people, enslaved Africans in this zone of the Luanga coast back then in the 18th century were French. Then French ship captains purchased African captives mainly to be transported to the French colony of Saint-Domingue. There were other French colonies as well, uh, but uh, especially to Saint-Domingue in what is present-day Haiti. And uh, there were then three main kingdoms uh, on the Luangu coast. Then the kingdom of Luangu, that the main port was Luangu, the kingdom of Kakongo, that the main port was Malembo, and the kingdom of Ngoyu, whose port was Cabinda, that is the, the case that I examine in the book. Now, a few miles separated these three ports, uh, which means that traders, for example, who uh, anchored in Malembo, they could easily sail to back and forth uh, to Cabinda. Now, each of these three states that you are talking about, they had rulers, uh, they had also several agents who occupied several offices. Then we are talking about the states, uh, organized the states with rulers uh, and uh, people occupying different offices. And uh, in the three different ports of Luango, Malembo, and Cabinda, the king had an agent that his name, that the name of the office was the Mufuka. And this is a word that appears in the, in the different sources, depending on the, the European language, then as uh, mafuki, ma, uh, then mafuk uh, and mafuk, uh, depending if it's Dutch or French or English or Portuguese. Now, unlike the king who resided then inland, the mufuka was established on the coast where the trade occurred. Europeans often described him as the Minister of Commerce as he controlled most part of the elements of the trade. And the Mufuka imposed then its captives uh, on local brokers and waived taxes on selected merchants uh, who in return would give uh, these agents gifts that contributed to their wealth that increased during the, the rise of the Atlantic slave trade, especially the most intensive period that is the 18th century, but continued to increase until the 19th century. So in June 1775, the French slave ship uh, Le Montillon, followed then by uh, the corvette uh, Lirondelle, 
sailed from the French port of La Rochelle to the Luango coast, then two ships. Amable Lesen was the captain in charge of Le Montillon, and Jacques Cous was the captain of L'Hirondelle, and a man named Daniel Garichet was a very rich ship owner, slave trader, and future mayor of La Rochelle, outfitted and owned uh, then these two vessels. So in a report that is available then in La Rochelle Depart uh, Department, Departmental Archives, um, that is not, uh, then the Charente Maritime, uh, the, 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 the archives of Charente Maritime that are based in La Rochelle. There is a report, and this report indeed is available now online. Uh, Lesen, who was the captain, explains that once on the Luango coast, he anchored in Malembo, but according to him, several local chiefs invited him to set anchor in Cabinda. Now, at this point, there were rumors of fights uh, then um, among uh, then different uh, tra European traders in this, in this area. But despite uh, these rumors, uh, he had then the guarantee from the Cabinda's Mufuka. His name is Andri Pukuta. And this man committed himself to stop these conflicts and promised Lesen to, prov uh, to provide him with 200 enslaved Africans over the course of three months. Then Lesen sent his captain, uh, then Jacques Cous, to Cabinda to complete the deal. Now, Cous arrived at a destination, and this is the story that uh, you can read uh, part of the story in this, on, this, um, on this document that you are seeing on the screen. Uh, Cous arrived at the destination, but after completing the transaction, he was attacked by 24 men from the ships commanded by three French captains. Not uh, then the, the, these are not British captains, are not Portuguese captains, are not Dutch captains. They are French captains from Bordeaux and Le Havre. Then these were Antoine Babineau, Jacques Thomas Barbel, and Jean-Baptiste Barbet, and their vessels were anchored in Cabinda. Now, the attackers seized his canoe uh, by taking down the captives and commodities on board and threatening to kill him. Uh, he was then forced, uh, then Kuss, to escape to land, and he and his five men had to took refuge in the house of the Mufuka, Andri Pukuta, that is mentioned in the documents. Then, thanks to this conflict, we have the trace, the record of all this story. Now, after this conflict, what we do know is that the, sh the, the captains of all these ships involved in this story uh, were able to purchase enslaved people, and they sailed to Saint-Domingue, where they landed then uh, dozens and dozens of African captives, as we can see here in the newspaper, uh, Affiche Américaine, of January 1776. Now, what happened next is that Lesen, the captain, and Garichet, the ship owner, were certainly grateful to the Mafuka, uh, Andri Pukuta, for having protected their lives, uh, therefore sending a sort of message to the other French slave traders that at this point were turned pirate, pirates in many ways. So, back in La Rochelle, Lesen and or Garichet commissioned a local silversmith the production of a solid silver ceremonial sword to be offered as a gift to the Mufuka in their next voyage to the Luango coast. It is very likely that the silver sword made its way to Cabinda in 1777, when Lesen traveled once again to the Luango coast as the captain of the same slave ship, Le Montillon. Now, La Rochelle's origin of the sword is attested by the presence then of several hallmarks that you can see here. Um, they, then, uh, and we have, through the hallmarks, we can know the date and the place where the sword was produced. But there is no hallmark uh, then indicating who was the silversmith. 
Very likely, and when this item went into auction, uh, th th it was by uh, association with formal elements of other items created by another silversmith that uh, the, the conclusion was that the possible silversmith was Jean-Baptiste Chalon, who by the time was uh, the most important silversmith uh, in La Rochelle. Here we have some images, then uh, an image of uh, several items that went on sale in 2012, including several 1775 items that are attributed to him. Now, uh, evidence for historians have to go beyond these formal elements. Then in uh, my research in the French archives, what I found, however, was a ship surgeon named Louis Chalon who traveled on board uh, le, the, 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 the slave ship Le Montillon in 1775 when the event, uh, the conflict took place. And this Louis Chalon also traveled again on board Le Montillon as a surgeon in 1777 when the gift was given to the Mufu Kandri Pukuta. So Louis Chalon was indeed the brother of Jean-Baptiste Chalon. And perhaps Louis Chalon himself was among the Seine's men who spent the night in, uh, at the Mufuka's house. Now, despite having been created then in La Rochelle, the format of this, uh, of this French sword is similar to that of a Kimpaba, then the plural in Kikongo is bimpaba, then kimpaba singular bimpaba uh, plural, which is a sort of prestige that existed on the Luangu coast already at the 18th century. Though the locally made kimpaba usually was manufactured in ivory, sometimes in iron, and wood. The one that we see here is wood. Now, Upon reaching Cabinda, the silver sword, however, that was manufactured in La Rochelle, was not a simple reproduction of a West Central African Kimpaba. Uh, the sword already embodied elements from the various cultures involved in the Atlantic commercial and cultural exchanges, including symbols that had cross-cultural significance then for West Central Africans and also for French, uh, then French people, French traders, French elites. Now, the sword then became a repository of sorts, conserving then the several layers and marks of these interactions developed during the, the era of the Atlantic slave trade. Now, one of the most visible elements of the, of the sword is uh, then this white tip uh, in which we have then the Latin cross. Perhaps, and this I explained in, in the book, then I will not be able to go into every single detail here. Perhaps this cross was already part of the original artifact um, fabri fabricated in La Rochelle. However, there is a possibility that this was added later. You are going to see why. The cross then pre-existed Christianity and was embraced then by Christians to symbolize Jesus of Nazareth's uh, crucifixion. But when the Portuguese, they reached the Luango coast, uh, then end of the uh, 15th century, the cross was already known of as Central African populations for which the cross evoked then the cycles of life. Um, whereas for Garreche, for example, in Shalom, the, the silversmith and also the, the, the surgeon, the people who commissioned the, the sword, commissioned, created, and produced it and ended up offering uh, the sword, the cross was, of course, for them a Christian symbol. Uh, for André Pukuta, the one who received the gift, the cross was also a meaningful symbol. Moreover, we know that Le Seine, the ship captain of uh, Le Montillon, was Catholic. This said, as you are going to see later, perhaps the cross was not part of the original La Rochelle design. Then the, the, the cross signifies something for this man. Some of them were Protestants, others were Catholics, uh, and it also signifies something for West Central African uh, agent who received it. 
There are two other elements on this uh, item that refer to elements that uh, are featured in other 18th century European silver items. For example, the handle, uh, which is similar, for example, to the handles of the candlesticks that I uh, showed to you earlier. And also the garland uh, that uh, was a very common decorative element in paintings, watercolors, and silver objects. For example, a watercolor representing the French slave ship La Marie Seraphique, which indeed is the, the watercolor that uh, representing Marie Seraphique that is on the poster announcing the conference. Uh, then La Marie Seraphique traveled to uh, the Luango coast uh, a, uh, a few years earlier, before then the, this story took place. And the, 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 the watercolor is framed by these garlands that as decorative elements, probably then symbolizing this idea of victory, and in this case, the victory of slave merchants who completed a successful slave voyage. So the garland uh, engraved on the silver sword may also have symbolized the successful slave voyage of Le Montillon et les Rondelles, thanks to the Mufuka of Cabinda. Now, uh, there are other elements here that you should take a brief look. Uh, for example, like other uh, swords of this kind, the fur French version includes this open work that has then uh, these uh, geometrical elements. There are 11 geometrical uh, figures that you see on the, on the false blade of the, the French sword. Yet, in the French version, the shapes were not cut out from the false edge, but were added to it. They are like very delicate and small rings, as you can see at the image uh, at, the, at the bottom. And these figures then are jagged semicircle. We have uh, two sets of two, um, of two equilateral triangles with confronting tips. We have a circle, we have uh, uh, one right triangle, we have also a vertical line that probably was a triangle that uh, was uh, damaged, and then we have a circle. But as you see on the top, on a West Central African Kimpaba, there are similar symbols as well that raise from the blade and that usually represent people, uh, houses, plants, and shells, and these are uh, elements that offer a vocabulary to the chief who would carry the sword, and uh, people would interpret, and the chief would interpret these symbols uh, with proverbs according then to the needs of the mo uh, moment. Then these elements are, uh, are in, to some extent, a form of writing. Now, among the people uh, of this area, of the kingdom of Ngoyu, they are called the Woyu, uh, these geometric symbols were also intended to underscore the political and supernatural powers of the Kimpaba's holder. Now, existing studies then of Woyu symbolism, they illuminated the possible meanings of these geograph uh, geometrical shapes, decorating then the locally made uh, swords. For example, the jagged semicircle evokes the sun. Uh, among the Woyu, this symbol refers to a commoner, and I quote here, then a man who presents himself every day as the sun usually does, unquote, because in this area, the nobles, uh, the man in Goyu, the ruler, hide from other sight and from contact with the commoners. Thus, the presence of a sun symbol in the open work of a kimpaba locally made would suggest that the holder of this insignia was a commoner. As a result, if the kimpaba was once the insignia of the king, during the 18th century, and especially in the 19th century, it became part of the Mufuka's regalia, of the king's agent even though this agent was a man who lacked royal status. Then this transformation seems to be in line with the fact that with the growth of the Atlantic slave trade, more royal agents were directly playing the role of 
intermediaries between the king and the European traders, and consequently, they acquired more wealth and more political power. Now, we have other items among the Woyu, uh, such as, for example, the spot leads that belong then to clan chiefs uh, that could also even then display different elements also as proverbs, but also would display the very image of the Kimpaba, creating then a meta-narrative of sorts. Then we have the real Kimpaba, but we also have the representation of the Kimpaba on the spot leads. So as sorts of prestige and objects of power, since their inception, Bimpaba were speaking objects, which, as put by Jennifer Trimble, and I quote her, address the reader outside themselves. Then these swords convey a narrative composed then of geometrical symbols used to communicate existing proverbs that are usually associated with a particular clan or village. But although the symbols on the silver version are in dialogue with the open work of those swords created locally in West Central Africa, the symbols on the French-made sword were likely added to the sword after the sword left Cabinda. Then the, the open work is not part of the original Kimpaba when it was fabricated in La Rochelle. It was not added very probably in Cabinda, but it was added after it left Cabinda, then when it reached Dahomey. Now we have to come back now to the French traders that we are here for them. By 1786, French slave trader Louis de Grandpré, who traded in Cabinda and Malembo in, 17, uh, in the 1780s, he witnessed the inhumation of André Pucutá, the man who received this gift. And he narrated the, 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 the funeral and represented in an engraving that was, uh, then he drew, then he created this drawing and uh, was, it became an engraving. And this funeral probably occurred then in 1786 in the first year of the Grand Prix in Cabinda. Now, in his travel account, the Grand Prix explained how complex and long were the funerary rituals on the, the Luang coast, uh, especially then, of course, the important man. The body was emptied of its organs, parched and coated with a thick layer of red earth. The deceased, the, then the, the, the belongings of the deceased uh, were would be added to the corpus and then wrapped in a bundle whose size was proportional to the wealth uh, and the importance of the deceased. And the, the, the bundle became then composed of numerous and different layers of different kinds of cloth before being permanently buried. Now there is an entire story here then uh, confirming then Pukuta's importance uh, the Grand Prix described the performance of all the rituals and including then the wrapping of the body and to form the giant bundle which lasted, and this funeral lasted one entire year. Now my first assumption, and then you can read the, 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 the travelogue by the Grand Prix, it's available online and so on, but my first assumption when, uh, after reading the description uh, several times, was that the silver kimpaba was buried with Pukuta. But because the kimpaba was a valuable object and was the Mufuka's insignia, despite this, its foreign origin, this hypothesis became unlikely as other ethnographic descriptions refer to these swords being passed down to the deceased's successor. Then, although Pukuta's Kimpaba was probably displayed among his belongings then during his funeral, more likely it was passed down to his successor. And then in the book, I explain this in more detail. However, for the purposes of this that is becoming long, uh, what we know for sure is that at some point, 
After the death of Pucutá, the Kimpaba was taken from Cabinda and brought back to La Rochelle, from where it was likely transported either directly to Huida or perhaps through Porto Novo first, then were uh, ports on the Bight of Benin, and then carried to, the, to Dahomey, to the capital Abomey, then uh, where, from where it was eventually looted. Now, the best candidates to have carried the sword to Abomey were indeed the French slave traders themselves. And probably by 1787, just after the death of André Pucutá. Then in the book, I explored the different hypotheses, and I have to discard each hypothesis after uh, they don't work. Then the most uh, reliable hypothesis is that this is what happened, that this sword was transported uh, to the Bight of Benin in 1787 and reached uh, the capital of uh, Dahomey, Abomey. Then French slave ships, and sometimes indeed, and this is something that is important for us to understand the French slave trade in this area, is that French slave ships and sometimes the same ship captain, including those from La Rochelle, they alternated voyages to the Luango coast and the Bight of Benin. Then the Bight of Benin, uh, the port of Ouida, it was also a, a biggest, uh, the biggest French uh, hub uh, then in West Africa. But in West Central Africa was the Luangu coast. Now these two regions, they are usually studied separately, but they are connected. We have a triangle that is not the, only the triangle that, uh, triangle that includes the Caribbean, but is the triangle that means the, the, the Luangu coast to La Rochelle, then to the Bight of Benin. And uh, then this sword was probably then um, uh, carried first to La Rochelle and then uh, brought to the Bight of Benin uh, through these networks. Now the year 1787 matters because in that year, the soldiers of the Homey attacked French traders from several slave ships that were trading in Porto Novo that was near the port of Ouida, which was the most important West African uh, then hub uh, then from where the French transported enslaved people then to their colonies in the West Indies, especially Saint-Domingue. So in this attack of 1787, 1787 the Daomen soldiers, they took French men and they took the, their goods. And to solve the situation, the director of the French fort in Ouida, Gourg, uh, he had to pay a ransom to the king of Dahomey. This was common uh, that they would have to pay ransom to have to get their men back and their goods back. The Portuguese usually would not pay any ransom. They would just let their traders uh, go, but the French were more humane in the this, in this, in this sense. Then it would not be surprising if the, the, the French Kimpaba was either stolen by the Daomian attackers or provided as part of the ransom or gifts to the king of Dahomey and probably Pengla, who was the king at the time, to appease him. Now, once the sword reached uh, Abomey, the capital of the kingdom of Dahomey, it was kept at the royal palaces like many, many other prestigious items that were manufactured locally and abroad. So the migration of the silver kimpaba to Abomey raises then questions regarding the geometric symbols that we referred to earlier that would have been added to the, 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 the sword after it reached uh, Abomey. So we have this practice of amending silver objects to adorn them uh, in many African societies. Uh, silver is a, a metal that allows to, to be melted and uh, reshaped according to the, 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 the main trends of the moment. This happened in Europe, but it was also a, a happening in West Africa. Also, there were established silversmith workshops in Abomey. Uh, there is one in particular that is the family Ontungi. They were silversmiths. 
Then I argue that the open work was added in Abome, uh, where local artisans and manuf uh, would manufacture, create and manufacture this uh, panoply of uh, silver objects, some of them that incorporated uh, European and West African elements. Then this is just to give you an idea about these objects that were created in Abome. This one is here in Baltimore. Uh, this other one is at the Met. These other ones are at the Met as well in New York City and uh, were carried from Dahomey during the conquest of Dahomey. They were basically looted and they are here in New York City now. But um, in the case of the, the Kimpaba, then this is just for you to see this, the, the, the wealth of objects that were manufactured locally by Abome artisans. So the Kimpaba's added open work includes then 11, 11 symbols divided then into three sets that we can see here. Some of these geometrical forms are comparable to the cut out figures that are found in from, from the people of Dahomey uh, in their ceremonial swords. Uh, these ceremonial swords are called gubasa, and they gave birth then to the, the vodun, the deity, the fawn god of war and metal that is here represented in a sculpture that was looted from Dahomey and today is displayed at the Musée uh, du Louvre uh, in Paris. Then this artwork is in dialogue with our silver kimpaba because in addition then to the diamond shapes, this huge gubasa held by the iron warrior bears circle shapes as well as two confronting triangles. And this is a symbol evoking then the double X associated with the vodun, uh, the vodun god, Evioso of thunder, and also has the equivalent uh, in uh, the Yoruba pantheon uh, as Shango. So the jagged semicircle symbolizing the moon and the circle signifying the sun likely evoke the feminine masculine couple of Odun deities, Mayu, Lisa, that are associated with the creation of the world that embodied then the division between the world of the living, the sun, and the world of the dead, moon. Uh, the day and the night, the sky and the earth. Their complementary nature is what divided the Homey's political organization, which was divided then into these masculine and feminine uh, realms. So the added open work on the blade of the silver kimpaba became a unique object of power and prestige that engaged central dimensions of the Homian cosmology by activating these voduns that were Evioso, Gu, and Mau, uh, Lisa. And the duality also represented by the symbols was not exclusive uh, to the home, was also part of the cosmology that we could find on uh, societies on the Luangu coast, where these crosses, diamonds, ovals, and crescent shapes signifying the sun and the moon also appear as we remember on the spot leads uh, where uh, we have then a variety of symbols. And also, uh, even on tombstones uh, of the early uh, 20th century, you see then here the pot leads where the, the, the kimpaba appears, but we also see then it's here on this uh, for you is on the, on the left, but you also see the gubasa represented in the textiles created in the home, the same kind of, um, of uh, sword of prestige. And when the, the sword reaches the home, it's not an object that is an alien object. It's not totally alien. There are uh, elements that uh, correspond to what is produced locally. Now, by introducing then, um, then uh, I would say that overall, after then this addition of the open work, this French silver kimpaba started then embodying the symbolic duality that we mentioned earlier that characterized then the political structure of Ngoi and also Dahomey. 
Now, by introducing then the, in the silver kimpaba symbols found in the powerful gubasa, and these, uh, these uh, silversmiths uh, of uh, Dahomey, they also created a meta-narrative of sorts that is similar to the one that was found here on the pot lids and also on the, the textiles that we uh, see um, that were produced in the home. Finally, the last element that you are going to, to qu quickly look at is the Latin cross uh, at the tip of the blade. Then, um, then this cross was carved at the same location where in other locally produced silver uh, bimpaba, we find not the Latin cross, but the Congo symbol Jikenga that was usually cut out from these boyo swords. And this is a, a, a symbol that refers to this cosmology, to the universe uh, in uh, Congo cosmology. Now, in the research I, I did, I didn't find any of the locally produced uh, then, uh, kimpaba, bimpaba, the, the, the cross. However, I found the cross at the same place in scepters that were created in Dahomey. Then it's very probably that this element, the cross, was not added in, uh, it was not part of the original sword, it was not added in, the, uh, in Cabinda, but was added in the home to be in dialogue with their own scepters. Now, uh, in terms of possible addition, as uh, we already mentioned, uh, locally in La Rochelle, then uh, neither Garriche, who commissioned the, um, the sword, nor the silversmith who created the Kimpaba, none of them were Catholics, and ultimately what were the Catholics who uh, used material culture as an instrument of conversion during the era of the Atlantic slave trade. But uh, in the case of the objects that we see in the home, these crosses uh, were part of their uh, vocabulary for very long. Then it's very possible that along with the Vodun symbols that we see here uh, on, the, on the blade, it's very possible that the cross was also added when the sword reached Dahomey. After all this, um, to, through the hands then of La Rochelle, the slave traders and silversmiths, these oil agents and also the Abome silversmiths, the Kimpaba was transformed into a complex cultural, cross-cultural object of power. And also as a speaking object of power, the silver kimpaba is bearer then of several messages. There are the French words praised in the Mufuka's qualities as a rightful man, um, and uh, the, uh, as rightful man who engaged um, Kabinda then by doing so with this, uh, the, the message uh, written in French, these slave traders were engaging the other slave trades who were trading in Cabinda. And were also reinforcing the, the importance then of uh, Pukuta, the, the local agent, and his political prestige. Now, with the added open work with pictograms evoking Vodun deities, uh, they addressed then the members of the Dahomey royal court and commoners who may have occasionally admired the king of Dahomey going out, uh, parading among his, um, then, uh, among his people and bearing the Kimpaba during public appearances. So the Kimpaba marked this important moment of the Atlantic slave trade on the Luangu coast uh, where uh, the Mafuka acquired then increasing wealth and power. And when European agents who sailed to the region to acquire enslaved Africans uh, also witnessed growing rivalries, especially during the second half of the 18th century. So this new configuration gave more power to local men who acted on behalf of the king as middlemen in this inhuman trade. 
Now, the Cabinda's Mufuca, like the Mufucas of Malembo and Luango, were among these intermediaries. So, despite having left Cabinda at some point after the, Pucu, uh, the, the Mufuca's death, uh, the Silver Kimpaba's legacy remained active on the Luango coast for many decades. During the 19th century, European traders and colonizers increasingly manufactured silver bimpaba to offer them as a gift to local agents. As we can see here, we have two identical uh, bimpaba that were given not by the French, but by the Portuguese, uh, made in silver, given to chiefs on the Luango coast in the late 19th century. Here we have another example of uh, another one given to a local ruler by the Portuguese uh, and a, a big one. So to conclude, we can say that from the point of, uh, of view of history, the French silver kimpaba helped us to interrogate the forced migration of peoples and the migration of things during the era of the Atlantic slave trade. The study of this case also sheds new light on the history and memory of the French Atlantic slave trade by connecting the French slave trading ports, such as La Rochelle, to African societies such as the Kingdom of Ngoyo in West Central Africa and the West African Kingdom of Dahomey, two African regions, as I already mentioned, that have been traditionally studied separately by scholars working on the history of the Atlantic slave trade. This story also helped us better understand in the last years of the French slave trade, just before the rise of the Saint-Domingue Revolution. Finally, as the officers of General Dodds looted the Kimpaba from Dahomey in 1892, this object also allowed us to interrogate the connections between the French Atlantic slave trade and the rise of colonialism in West Africa. And we can end that story by saying that following the auction of 2015, the Kimpaba was acquired by the Musée du Nouveau Monde in La Rochelle. This is a small public museum that was created in 1982, about a decade uh, before uh, the first important wave of public memory of slavery in France. Then this is 1982, uh, it's really in the, 19, the, the early 1990s that you are going to see this, this big wave emerging in, uh, in France. And this was looted at least twice. Uh, the Kimpaba then returned to Roi Rochelle, uh, the second largest former French slave trading port after Nantes. Uh, today it is, as we see here, prominently featured in one of the main rooms of the museum, which occupies the Hotel Fleuriot, uh, which is an urban mansion uh, once owned by Aimé Benjamin Fleuriot himself, an 18th century planter, ship owner, slave trader uh, in Saint-Domingue. Then at the museum, the Kimpaba establishes then an intriguing dialogue uh, with a full body sculpture representing Toussaint Louverture uh, by uh, then Senegalese artist uh, Osman So that was placed at the museum also in 2015. And uh, needless to say that monuments, full body monuments to, to Saint Louverture do not exist in France. This is the only full body uh, statue representing to Saint Louverture uh, in France. And it's in La Rochelle inside the, the, the court of the museum. Ultimately, from the point of view of memory, the Kimpaba then updates La Rochelle's slave trading past in the present, recreating then a dialogue among the French Atlantic slave trade victims and also the perpetrators and their descendants. Thank you. Interesting. Sorry. What, what uh, the, is this left foot resting on there? 
I, I, you yeah, know. Good question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, from the, I would have. I, I, I would. I would be able a, to tell okay. you looking at my at my computer uh, more in detail. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. What, what is happening with the food? There, there, are, there is another version of this same statue that used to be at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art um, in uh, Washington D.C. Okay. Then this is not the only one. But there are more to Saint Louverture in Washington D.C. than in yep. the Empire of France. It's still rock. <laughs> yeah, it's still rock. It's a rock. It's a rock. La pierre. La pierre. Yeah. Okay. So I'm asking this as an anthropologist um, mm -hmm. who's thinking about Kula and thinking about the spirit in the gift itself and its afterlives. And I kept thinking, what happens to a gift looted? That this is looted twice. What? And, and so I'm thinking about this. Does it remain a gift? What happens to a gift looted? And then I'm thinking about um, reparations. Um, seriously here, that it seems as if the narrative is that it's repaired back to La Rochelle, which is also an interesting transformation. Um, so um, they're just loose threads that I'm kind of left thinking with. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your question, which is uh, an important question. Also leads me to say how I got to this topic. Um, then in the past I wrote about the history of demands of uh, financial and material reparations. And uh, my intention in the beginning, when I started looking at this, uh, then uh, my intention in, uh, in the beginning was to write uh, about the demands of restitution of African uh, objects then to African countries. And um, I, uh, then this object, uh, I came across this object. Then I'm, I'm not going to say that I discovered the object or that I then, the, the, the object emerged in 2015 uh, in an auction. Then um, I decided to look at this object exactly because it disrupted a lot the story of uh, restitution. Then it raises, uh, and I don't offer any answer uh, to that, which means that to where this, what is this object? Is this a French object? Is this a West Central African object? It is a uh, West African object because it was looted twice, but it was a gift to was, was West Central African men. Um, then this was carried to Abomey, and the king of Dahomey would have this in his hands, knowing uh, that this was not a gift for him. Um, and it was well written in, in, in French uh, to, to whom this object was uh, dedicated. Then there is, the, 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 it, it, it creates all these, these questions and also the possible fact that the same people who gave this object, they took it back. Then the French traders gave a gift and it's, in the beginning I thought that it was a story about Portuguese taking the object from Cabinda to, to, to Dahomey because the Portuguese have been in Cabinda prominently, especially then in the, in the 19th century, after the, the end of the, after the, the, the Asian Revolution. But uh, by doing research, I, my, my best hypothesis is that it was taken by the same people who gave the gift, and this gives another, uh, adds another layer. What does it mean to give a gift and taking it back? Uh, to re-give it uh, to someone else, or in then either to, to re-give or uh, the fact that this could have been looted also by, by the Homian soldiers uh, when they were fighting these, these slave traders. Then, of course, the idea of returning, the returning that the, uh, La Rochelle uh, purchased the object is about the idea that this was made in La Rochelle with silver that came from the wealth generated by the Atlantic slave trade, and it belongs there in La Rochelle. But it's interesting because the, today the, 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 the sword is uh, even in the booklet uh, of the museum. And uh, the story, very short, because it's not a very developed museum, but the story, very short, is about 
uh, that this was a pot de vin, that, uh, that this was a sort of bribe, that the, the gift, the, 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 the kimpabo was a bribe. That this is the idea, because these Africans down there, they, <laughs> they were trading in people and they, they were receiving bribes. Um, which is, of course, uh, a story that is um, a, a simplification of what uh, this object uh, means. But I, I think that the most important element here is not only about uh, thinking where this object should return or be repatriated or to where it belongs, but uh, perhaps to think how many stories uh, that are European and African, uh, stories that are told and also Asian, uh, stories that are told in one single object and in many objects perhaps that are around uh, in different museums. Thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering if you could say more about Kimpaba as currency and the choice to take silver, which might, once might have constituted coins, into an object such as this, and whether you have a sense of where most of the silver is coming from. Is it Potosi silver, or is it coming from elsewhere? And perhaps second, very quickly, if you have a sense of how Kimpaba are worn or displayed, is this a sort of something that's continuous with Islamic aid practice of wearing such swords in a sash or something like that? And if you're also seeing Islamic aid motifs in these kinds of objects, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, then uh, I, I go in, uh, then of course I, I discuss this issue in the, in the book, then there, there are, there are uh, ancestors to this, uh, the, to the Kimpaba locally made that were called Mbele. There are uh, then this sort of uh, swords that would be then belong to the king, would be carried by the king. And they are associated with this idea of uh, passing a message then uh, when the, the king would uh, then convey a message, they would have that, that insignia. But if a representative of the king would carry the insignia, then they, uh, people would, knew, uh, would know that the message was coming from, from the king. There are, uh, the ancestor of the, the Kimpaba is also associated with uh, human sacrifice. Apparently then in the, the past, the, the, the blade was a, a blade. And over time, it became then a false blade and became a ceremonial sword, even locally, uh, with these various materials. But you see that the materials were uh, uh, materials that existed locally in West Central Africa, then uh, iron, and then wood, and uh, ivory. Silver uh, existed also in, uh, in Africa and in West Africa, but uh, in that area, it was not uh, then a, a zone rich in silver. Then the silver enters there as part of the Atlantic slave trade, but this one is the oldest one that I found that is manufactured in Europe and brought to that area. I showed you others at the end of the presentation, but those were uh, our 19th century. Now, perhaps there were older ones, uh, but considering that it's silver, people could melt and uh, ob to obtain something else. In the case of Dahomey, however, it's clear that uh, this connection with uh, the coins appear uh, not on the on swords, but appears, for example, on the jewelry that they were fabricating. They were incorporating the silver coins in the, the very um, in the very jewelry that they were creating. And in terms of the possible sources of this the, this silver, then this silver then create uh, manufacturing France, but this was coming possibly through Spain, and was being mined in South America, possibly then by then enslaved Africans. Then uh, this is the also then the, 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 the Kimpapa embodies also that the story of the silver that was mined elsewhere by uh, enslaved people. Then uh, we have also that layer there. But uh, these ceremonial swords, once you enter this, this, uh, this world, then we, f you, we can find many other connections then uh, in other societies um, 
and then it would be interesting to look at. And even formally, uh, the, 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 um, the, the format that if you look at uh, the typology of this kind of swords, we are going to find it then uh, in uh, other uh, societies in the, the Muslim world. Thank you very much for that beautiful talk. Um, the dedication on the, um, the, knife, the knife is very striking too, and I'm wondering, um, the dedication, is it part, or have you noticed a culture of dedication um, or dedications on objects in this part of the African continent? Um, what can we say about dedication and sort of added value to the object? Um, and I'm just wondering if you came across other objects that had similar dedications, specifically royal dedications. Let me say that I, if for this region, no. Uh, for African objects, no. Later on, yes. Then later on, what we can find here, for example, in this last one, uh, then these are, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this one here, then uh, they, once the Portuguese started giving these uh, swords to, to, local, to locals in this area of um, West Central Africa, they would have the name of the chief engraved on it. And this one, we have the, the name of the company that was uh, now involved then in the colonial uh, enterprise of the Portuguese uh, then uh, but we do not have for other objects in silver that I remember now, for example, we have other gifts as the one that I showed you, for example, the, the crown in the beginning of the presentation that was given, that was to be given by the English and was seized by the Dutch, uh, but we don't have a dedication. Now, this is for the African objects, but objects with dedications on silver, there are plenty for example, to indigenous populations here in the United States, then whoever wants to do work on that, uh, it's not part of the French Atlantic, or perhaps we can have some, but there are objects here, uh, and in other contexts, there are silver objects, uh, and I have some of, uh, one of them in the book uh, with uh, these dedications. It's, it's, the, 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 the object itself with the dedication becomes a sort of monument. Uh, it memorializes, for example, battles or uh, treaties. Then this would be, um, the, the, the written inscription would mark that. It's, instead of having a treaty only on paper, you have uh, an object that seals that. And of course, today we give plaques, engraved plaques to people, like when they retire, when they uh, get a prize. <laughs> then uh, this is uh, another example of how this is to a sort of practice. So um, any, any other final, final? Yes, Pierre. Just, yes. Just a matter of clarification. Um, is there a difference between the two words, kimpada and chimpada? Uh, no, it's, it, it's, the same, it, it's the same word with different, um, with different spellings. When I use, when I use the, um, uh, in my captions, uh, different, um, then, uh, different spellings is because from where the photograph is coming from, I have to use that, uh, that spelling. Then, this is also, when you are looking for this, uh, for these items uh, in online collections, you have to use possible several spellings because if you look in Paba, you are not going to find, you use Bimpaba, Chimpaba, uh, and these sometimes are by Portuguese, sometimes, uh, for example, there is a German uh, ethnographer who did work in this region in the 19th century, then we find then today in Berlin, for example, in the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, and then they would have different uh, different spellings. The same for the mufuka. Then mufuka is uh, is the I got what would be the the, the closest to what is uh, in the in, in the local language. But then we had in different European languages in different documents the spelling will vary. But here is is just because the caption is because from the from where the, the, the photographs come, then I get, uh, I, I reproduce what they, they had as captions. Yeah, and, and one last thing, uh, uh, pada, the, uh, uh, is uh, sound also 
It reminds us of um, so, some words for sword in the uh, European language. Espadon, uh, espada. for example, or espada. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's espada in, in, in Portuguese. Yeah, that's right. Um, but the, and some people refer to quimpada, um, but the, the, the word is quimpada. Now, the, the research I did, not being uh, a specialist, uh, then uh, and, and I don't, don't don't speak. Don't, don't, I'm not a specialist of the, the language. I'm not a linguist. But uh, in uh, then the, the the term it appears then in uh, lo, uh, dictionaries in local languages then of uh, Kikongo. Then um, this is, was even a question that I had of a reader of the manuscript that said, "Ah, Kimpada, Espada," but uh, that. Uh, that is not a, I would say, a, a, a line that was a, I was able to, to prove any kind of, uh, of connection. But the term exists in the, then, uh, in the local languages, in the local language. So um, I'm just looking at the time. I, I think it's um, also interesting. One's tempted to see in this object uh, an extraordinarily singular unique object um, because of the way in which it tells these stories. But in fact, what you've done in this book, so magisterial, I think, is shown that in many ways there are conventions and traditions throughout this kind of French or just broader Atlantic world that this, uh, this object both reflects and works against, I think. And for some of the students who are in my 150 uh, class, uh, I think it's a really wonderful illustration of how somebody takes an object and sort of delves deep into the different histories and pulls out different aspects of it. Not all of the answers are here, uh, but enough of them are to really be suggestive of the way that an object like this can reflect a much broader world. So um, with that, uh, I invite you downstairs one level to the reception to have some food and drink, um, but not before we thank Ana Lucia for a fabulous talk. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you.